wasn't the worship just wonderful this morning? Pardon? I don't know quite uh, where we're going to be going this morning. I, um, all I know is what the Lord told me, spoke to me last night, and um, the reading that Joel so kindly read to us is, was to be the subject of our sermon and the subject for sermons for the next few weeks going forward. We're thinking about that scripture in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, etc., etc. Am I not turned on? Is that better? Okay, sorry about that. But um, as I said, I'm not the happiest of bunny this morning. I've spent too many days in hospital visits and visiting people who are sick, and there are any number of people that are really struggling in the life of our church with different infirmities, different conditions, uh, different things that are going on in their life which are simply, we know from Scripture, outside of God's plan and purpose. And so as I was thinking about this and praying about this last last night, I thought, Lord, I just want to be reminded what you think about sickness and illness. What do you say about it? And what did you do about it? And I think we need to stand on God's Word with regarding to health and healing, and we need to remind the enemy this is what we believe. We need to remind the enemy that the healing life that flowed out of Christ revealed the very nature of healing in the ministry of Jesus and the importance that he placed on it. And the first thing I'd say is that we've got to remember that Jesus healed hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Matthew 4 and verse 23, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and the paralytics, and he healed them. Some have argued that the stories that we have in the Gospels represent the few, just the few dozen that Jesus healed. But that's not true. The Gospels clearly teach us that he healed multitudes. This was a very common feature of his earthly ministry. Healing wasn't a secondary or, or subsidiary activity for him. And then secondly, I think we need to remind ourselves we have to change our perception of the way that we pray for people to be healed. You know, over, over my life, I, I've sort of wrapped my arm around people and Oh God, you know, I know that you love Sister Susie and I know that she's a pain in the arse and all, and I know about all that, but Lord, but I know you love her and oh God, if if you, you, Jesus never healed anybody like that. We don't come to our Heavenly Father asking, asking Him for something He's not willing to give. Begging like some lost tramp in the universe. You come as a son of God. You have entered the holy place through the blood of the cross. Psalm 107 says, He sent out his word and he healed them and he delivered them from their destruction. Who is the word of God? Jesus. So when you look at that worked out in the context of the Gospels, and this isn't David's view This is how it is. Apart from the raising of Lazarus from the dead, there's not a single incident in the gospel where Jesus directly prays for the healing of the sick. Nowhere. Whereas prayer certainly occurs before ministering to the sick, we pray at 9 o'clock in the morning. 
We pray for the Spirit to come. So whereas prayer certainly occurs before ministering to the sick, the sick in Jesus' world were never prayed for. But the dead were commanded to rise. Mark 5, taking the little girl by the hand, Jesus said to her, Talitha kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And um, uh, the, immediately the, the girl got up and began walking. Or, or Luke 7 and verse 14, then Jesus came and touched the briar, and the bearers stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. And it's the same with the lame. He commanded them to get up. Mark 2.11, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Anne Roberts in Columpton in 1996 heard the Lord say the same words, arise. And she got out of the wheelchair and she walked home. The man with a shriveled hand is commanded to stretch it out. Matthew 12, the ears of the deaf mute are commanded to be open. Mark 7, I have one time done that, have seen that myself. I was in a meeting and, and uh, I was aware of this uh, woman uh, and she wanted prayer and she was deaf. She was born deaf. She didn't have the bits that she needed to be able to hear in her right hand ear and I began praying for it and I knew what the Lord wanted me to do but I didn't have the, the nerve to do it I sort of hung around and didn't do it and in the end I thought I've got to do that I spat in her ear and I said woman hear in Jesus name and God restored her healing <clears throat> I've only done that once you'll be <laughs> pleased to hear the leper is commanded to be cleansed, Matthew 8. And Luke 13, before healing the crippled woman in the temple, you'll remember the woman who had probably had spondylitis, Jesus announces to woman. And the word he uses for woman is a sort of a, 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 a word that reflects back on what God created her to be, which she wasn't at this time. He said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then thirdly, no one who touched Jesus was left unhealed. Isn't that extraordinary? No one who touched Jesus desiring he healing was unhealed. Matthew 14 and verse 34, And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gethsemane, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all in that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched the fringe of his garment were made well. You see, we look at healing through the spectacles of our own experience. And we've grown up in a world where it doesn't ha happen very often. It doesn't happen very often in, in my world, uh, I confess. But I've seen more and more as my ministry has gone on. God has increased my faith. And I believe as a church it's important that we see our faith grow in this arena of healing. According to Matthew 8, he healed all who were sick. What does that tell me about God's heart or his will for healing? Psalm 103, who forgives all our iniquity, who heals all our diseases, who relieves our, redeems our life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I had the opportunity uh, a few days ago to go pray for someone I love very dearly. He's in a treatment center a long way away from here. And he looks like a youth. His, his countenance has changed. He's got his back pocket full of 
uh, cards with scriptures written on them, and he, they were dog-eared because he's been getting them out, and he's been praying them and reading him back to God. God is redeeming his life from the pit as God is fulfilling the scripture, and God has given him to faith to believe he will do it. Fourthly, and we have to hammer this one home because it's outside of our comprehension, but Jesus never inflicts anyone with a disease or ever suggests that sickness is a blessing for God for obedient people. Never. Healing and health are always portrayed in Scripture as blessing of God, not disease and decay. In fact, Jesus rebukes illness. Luke 4 and verse 39 he bent over the lady and he rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Jesus always viewed illness as the enemy. Jesus always viewed sickness as the enemy. Jesus nowhere told his followers to expect sickness or disease as part of their calling or their life or their ministry. Jesus never suggested that sickness was a cross they needed to bear. Jesus never, ever suggested sickness with the cross his disciples were to bear. He promised persecution. He promised slander. He promised eventual martyrdom for many. But, he, but never disease and never sickness. And so whereas all sickness is suffering... Not all su suffering is not sickness. There's no beatitude that said, blessed are the sick. They may be blessed, but it isn't because they're sick. It's because of how they handle that situation. Acts 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, we read, Peter says, with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now note the connection here between do, doing good and healing. Healing is doing good in Jesus' thinking. Therefore, disease is an evil that we are to resist. Sickness and disease in itself does not glorify God. What glorifies God is our, um, our unwavering faith and loyalty and love in spite of sickness and disease. But the disease in itself does not glorify God. So as a church, as a people, as individuals, we must not resign ourselves to sickness. We must not acquiesce to it. We mustn't yield to it. There is one New Testament um, rider to that. It's Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where God says that to keep him from abasement, he assigned a demonic tormentor to him. But that is the only reference you'll find to that in the whole of the New Testament. Always assume that it's God's will to heal unless we're shown otherwise by divine revelation or we die. Fifthly, Jesus portrayed healing not simply as a sign that the, the kingdom of heaven was coming, but he, he, he portrayed it as an essential element of the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom of God in part consists of deliverance from demonic spirits and healing from emotional, from mental, and from physical disease. Do I hear an amen? amen? We have too many people totally reliant on psychiatric medicine. Where is the church of God in the healing of people that have been broken by mental illness? I point the finger at me. Luke 9 and verse 1, he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He didn't say just physical. He didn't say just emotional. He didn't say spiritual. He sent them out to heal. 
and he sent them out to announce and to preach that the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is here to bring healing. Healing was neither a gimmick to get people to come to church nor a confirmation that the kingdom was present. Healing is the presence of the kingdom. When we pray, we are standing the ground that says we are members of the kingdom of heaven. We live in a realm that is God's. On the last day, that realm will become a reign. I like to say that we're living on that day when on the beaches of Normandy, all the Allied forces landed. The war was over. Hitler's days were numbered, but it took a year or so before Berlin fell and Hitler was dead. We're living in those days. The end is over. Jesus has done it on the cross. And in this period before he returns, we are to expect to see substantial healing in every area of our lives. Paul says we're to be changed from glory to glory. Our lives are to become more righteous, more holy. We are to, have no, we are to say no to sin. We are to say no to unrighteousness. As we're going to see in that passage in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we are to be completely changed. When we compare ourselves with the picture we're given in, in Acts 2, if we don't measure up, we need to ask ourselves, are we really born again? Healing is the presence of the kingdom. Number six, the earthly ministry of Jesus, primarily his miracles and healings, were not so much a result of his divine nature, but rather the power of the Spirit working through him. Jesus spent 30 years as a carpenter. It was when he was baptized and the Spirit was poured out upon him that he began his power ministry. And that in itself is a sign to you and me. Oh, how we need that baptism in the Spirit, the release of those gifts, in order that we can do the works of Jesus. Fear not, little flock, Jesus said to his disciples. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He could have said, as he's given it to me. Jesus self-consciously healed people by the power of the Holy Spirit. We read, they brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could speak and see. He did that through the power of the Spirit. And then we need to say that most often Jesus' healings were instantaneous. And during the, particularly during the 90s revival, as Jack Deere was reminding me uh, in an email yesterday, we saw that all the time. I don't remember meetings, Saturday night meetings particularly, when at least one person didn't get delivered from a demon. You just hear it in church, the, the person would rise up, scream, fall down, and it was almost as if you could see the demonic force running out the door. We have to pray for the quality of revival that we saw in those days to come again. Most often, we saw they were instantaneous healings, but on some occasions, they were gradual and partial. One lady we prayed for every Sunday for a year before she got healed. But we did it. We were persistent. Jesus gives us the wonderful story of the man who was born blind, that he prayed for him. And after Jesus prayed for him, he asked the man, well, can you see? And he said, well, I don't know, really. I can see what looks like trees walking. So Jesus prayed for him again, and then his total sight was, was, was set free and healed. And I think there are many people we have to keep praying, keep believing, keep doing the stuff. Because... Number eight, Jesus' healings were subject to two factors, the presence or the absence of faith, and secondly, the purpose of his heavenly Father. As for faith, if you struggle to believe, sometimes it's good to let other people exercise faith on your behalf. But you see, faith, there's so much rubbish spoken about faith. Faith is like a garden. If you are a person involved in daily Bible study, 
If you are a person that seeks to live your life in righteousness and holiness and according to the tenets of God's Word, if you daily commune with Him, if you keep the weeds out of the garden and allow the rain of God's Word to water and the sunshine of His love, then good fruit will grow. But if you let the garden be covered in weeds, don't expect to see a good harvest. But as we do these things, then when the time is ripe and we need it, faith is there. Then there are times when God just gives faith to a person. That gift of faith. And that's fabulous too. G number nine, Jesus regularly healed the sick by the laying on of hands. One of the things that's happening during this whole you know, revolution where women are coming forward, rightly so, and saying they'd been abused or they'd been fondled inappropriately and all of that. You know, it's right for, the, for, the, for that to happen. It's right for women to take their place within society. It's right that the men that have done that over the years are, are, are publicly brought down. But there are some things that come along with that that are not healthy. One of the things that's come of, uh, along with that in Europe is people are now scared to lay hands on other people in case it's misinterpreted. And yet, most often when Jesus prayed for the sick, he laid hands on people. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who were in any way sick with various diseases were brought to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. And sadly, so many evangelicals lack an appreciation uh, for this dimension of healing ministry. But the hand of God in Scripture is only anthropomorphism. It's, 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 uh, it's giving um, sort of human expression to something which, is, which is, is a spiritual reality. The hand of God in Scripture represents His purpose or His plan or His will. So when we lay hands on people, we're saying, Lord, this is your plan, this is your purpose, this is your will. The hand of God also represents God's sovereign power, his strength to carry out that purpose. And the hand of God, thirdly, is commonly seen in Scripture as offering sovereign protection in delivering blessing and saving life to his people. So when we lay hands on God, there's nothing special about your hands what you're doing is representative of what God is doing. And so you may ask, well, why this trauma about it at the moment? Why is it, I guess, you know, people are ignorant of the Scriptures, or I guess people might think it violates their personal space. You know, people in an elevator. I was in a hospital elevator yesterday, and I was standing by the door, and, you know, I saw everybody sort of go to their four corners. That happens, doesn't it, sometimes? Or maybe you come from a family where there wasn't hugging or kissing or touching or showing affection. Then that can carry over into every area of your life. Maybe it means we need to, you know, to learn afresh how to lay hands on people. You know, we don't lay hands on people and... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> maybe we can... I mean, it's, it's, it's a picture, it's an image, it's anthropomorphic as I say so we can hold our head above someone it's what it represents it's not the there's nothing special about your hand maybe there are fear of sexual implications or fear of magic or occult associations we have to work through those we have to teach about this we we have to share I'm coming to an end tenth Jesus interpreted many physical uh, um, afflictions many illnesses as the work of Satan. We've got to understand that Satan is out to get our church. We've got to understand that Hayton, Satan hated the fact that our people went off and got trained in prayer ministry in Florida last week. We've got to understand that God wants you hooked on porn, God wants you hooked on drugs, God, uh, the devil wants you hooked, hooked on all of these things so that your life in God will fail. That's a fact. Scripture calls him a liar. Scripture calls him um, an angel of light. 
It looks very attractive to begin with. Scripture uh, calls him a thief. Scripture calls him the destroyer. And Paul tells us that we need to be aware of his schemes. Paul tells us that we do not need to give him a foothold. That little place that he can rightfully own in your life where he can put his foot. That's the great thing about pornography. Not only has it caused you great shame, but it digs a little hole in you where Satan finds it much easier to land and to fire all his other bombs and rockets into, your, into one's life. And many of the afflictions, uh, God looks at us holistically. God doesn't look at us through Greek uh, philosophy, which regarded man as mind and his spirit and his soul as separate. The scriptures look at us holistically. Everything affects everything else. If you have a physical condition, it affects you spiritually. If you have a spiritual uh, malady, it affects you emotionally. If you have an emotional or mental issue, it affects you spiritually. We're all connected because we're one. And Satan is in there to try and affect you and afflict you. Matthew 4, so Jesus' fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all who were sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures, those who are paralytic, and he healed them. So what I take from this important scripture is that deliverance is very often a prelude and a necessary part of physical healing. People who are alcoholics, it's great to get them dried out. It's great to get them off the juice. That is the first step. The second step is the healing that needs to take place that rewires those parts of the brain that chemically have been changed by alcohol. And there may be deliverance needed as well. And then penultimately, number 11, Jesus identified some sickness as totally unrelated to personal sin. Somebody asked me this week, do you think it's because I've sinned? I said, well, what have you done? And he told me, I said, well, that's not good, is it? But I don't believe this illness is a result of your sin. And it's easy to think that. We love to find solutions and quick answers. In John 9, Jesus and the boys were on a ministry trip. And they came to the pool, and there was a man there who had been born blind. So the disciples, the first thing they say is, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? That's how they saw it. You're blind, you've sinned. And Jesus said, no. He said, it's not, it's not that the man had sinned or his parents, but it's so the works of God might be shown. And Jesus healed him. And then the Pharisees dragged him into the temple and said, you can't be healed because Jesus did it on the Sabbath. So on the one hand, you've got the disciples, he must have sinned. On the other hand, you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees saying he can't be healed because he did it on the Sabbath. And all the guys going around and saying, well, I don't care, but all I know is once I was blind, but now I see. But there are times when sin does cause us sickness, particularly unforgiveness. If you're holding unforgiveness in your heart, get rid of it. If you think what someone has done has hurt you, wait and see what unforgiveness will do to you. Jesus tells us the parable of the man who uh, goes to the king and appeals against his debt. And the king forgives him and he leaves and as he comes outside the palace, he meets another man who owes him. And the same happened. The man asked for forgiveness, and the man said, no, you've got to pay every debt, or else I'm going to throw you in prison. And then that man goes to the Lord and reminds him that he forgave the man originally, but the man won't offer the same forgiveness. And so Jesus tells the parable about the prison that that man will be locked in. And if you read it in the original Greek, it implies physical disabilities, I have met hundreds of people who live in unforgiveness, who have heart-related issues, that have pain-related issues, that have arthritic 
related issues. Not always. There are other physiological reasons for all of those things, of course. But make sure there's no unforgiveness. Sometimes sickness can be caused by sin. And then lastly, virtually all of Jesus' healings were motivated by love and compassion. And that's to be our heart and motivation here at Christ Church, isn't it? My sermon this morning was going to be about fellowship, about meeting together in small groups as we read in Acts 2.42. And the reason we do that is because we love one another. We want to care for one another. I want to be there for one another. Jesus' ministry of healing came out of love and compassion. Matthew 14, when, when he went ashore and saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. It was compassion, not fame, that was his motivation, and it's evident from the instructions that he gave the disciples. We've got to remember these scriptures. We've got to reset the clock, as it were. We've got to say that, David, I've got to, I've got to say to myself, your Christian life is not normal Christianity. What is normal Christianity is what I read here in the scriptures. I need to do what it takes in my life that, that we see greater and greater healing. As a church, we are a church that has traditionally had a healing ministry. That's why we sent people to Florida this last week. That's why we've trained one ministry team. That's why we're about to train another ministry team. Because we believe that God heals. But we've got to be reminded of these great, great scriptures. We've got to be reminded about our Lord and Savior. We've got to go back to the beginning, to Jesus. He's the beginning and say, Lord, what do you say about healing? What is your heart about healing? What can the Gospels teach us about healing? And it's out of that that our life is to grow. We've got to take off the spectacles of our traditions. Take off the spectacles for our lack, my lack, but spectacles of lack of faith, because in seminary I wasn't taught that Jesus healed today. I've got to take those away and throw it away, and I've got to go back to the Scriptures, the Word of God, which is what I stand on, and I've got to say, Lord, this is what it says here. I know my experience doesn't match up, but this is what it says here. This is where I take my stand. Now, this morning, if you're here, if you are sick, and I feel the Lord has given us two indicators for people that have chronic conditions, ongoing conditions, We've had two sort of prophetic indicators, one uh, through uh, uh, Richard Jones and, what, uh, and one came through Joan and I receiving an email from somebody last night. Two indicators that we are to pray for people that have ministered to people that have uh, long-term conditions. And uh, we're going to have commu Holy Communion right now. And then after Holy Communion, we're going to invite the the presence of God to come and heal. And I'm going to ask the prayer ministry team to stay here, not go to the chapel, and we can gather in different places around the church, and uh, we're just going to invite God to come and heal. And we will stay here as long as you stay here. Some of you might need to go home, that's great, that's fine. There's nothing unspiritual about taking the chicken out of the oven or going to beating the, beating the Baptist to nukes but it may be that you want to stay. It may be you want to do business with God, and I believe God is here to heal. It may be that you're here representing somebody who's needing healing. It may be that you're representing somebody who's in hospital or in treatment. It may be that you're here representing some bondage in your own life that it hasn't yet affected you in any physical or emotional way, but it's there, and you know it's a time bomb waiting to go off. I believe God gives us these windows of opportunities, and I believe I prophesy today is one of those. So we're going to take advantage of what God is leading us to do. We're going to stand.